just want to smile at you for a while. <laughs> aware of some heaviness that some of us carry today for various reasons. On my way into the church building this morning, I try and park somewhere at a distance where it'll give me the time to pray as I'm walking into the building. And on my walk in, I heard a dove singing, looked for it, it was right up on the very top of our sanctuary. Mm. Did any of you hear that coming in? I didn't realize that that was God's way of saying, yes, the Holy Spirit is even in the midst of the heaviness that some people are carrying today. The Spirit is, is with us. The heaviness comes from some of the news that we've seen this week. Some of you have shared with me even before the service started. Some of you have shared just recently some of the stuff you're carrying for your family and um, the worries that you have. And that may fit into the landscape of the Transfiguration. There's so many directions that we could go with the Transfiguration. There's so many metaphors, so much meaning. But I want to lift up just a, a paradigm of how often God works in our spiritual lives. And it is through a process of orientation, disorientation, reorientation. In our faith journeys as followers of Jesus, <clears throat> we are blessed if someone helps orient us towards the love of God and Jesus Christ. Maybe that's a Sunday school teacher, a parent, a pastor, a brother or sister in Christ, someone who mentors us to that orientation, to know that there's some truth here that can help us in our lives. But then something happens in the spiritual journey that disorients us. Maybe it's a loss. Maybe it's a trauma. Maybe it's news not going our way. Maybe it's something that just throws us off balance and makes us even question God or question the initial orientation we had. Disorientation is a significant part of the spiritual life. I wish someone had told me that when I was young. And then the Spirit reorients us. To look at Jesus and the love of God and the mystery of God in a new way. That's not the initial orientation way. Because we've been disoriented and reoriented. It's a process. The disciples for whom the Word of God was focused, this passage, this Word of God was not necessarily to Jesus that spoke from the cloud. It was to the disciples, to us. Do you realize how even that process of orientation, disorientation, reorientation is happening in these few Seven, uh, nine verses. The disciples, Peter, James, and John, are brought up to the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus. They're oriented to focusing on him. He is having this mystical conversation with Moses and Elijah. They're oriented towards that conversation. And then a cloud comes and overshadows the mountain. They can't see in front of their faces. It's disorienting. Have you ever gone through a season of your life where you just can't tell what's next? Some of you may be right there right now. 
The disciples are disoriented by the cloud. And out of the cloud, a voice of God says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased to listen to him. He's not talking, the voice is not talking to Jesus. The voice is talking to the disciples and to us and to the church, listen to him. The disciples fall on their faces. They can't, they can't process this. The cloud lifts and Jesus is left standing there alone. And he says, come, let's, let's go down the mountain now. He goes down the mountain to a place of teaching and healing and orienting, reorienting his path and their path towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, towards resurrection. In that seven verses, you see them oriented, disoriented, reoriented. That's the, the path we're all on. Although I sense sometimes we resist disorientation with all our might. We might be able to see that which disorients us as not necessarily good, certainly not enjoyable, but maybe a part of the process that God is using to bring us to a reorientation in our faith lives. This past Monday, I was invited up to a prayer vigil at the county courthouse in Hackensack, Bergen County Courthouse. I was invited by the Peace Islands Institute, our, our partners in interfaith dialogue. They are uh, Muslims from Turkey. Very often they have provided meals for us here at our Abraham lunches, at our interfaith iftar dinners. They have been wonderful and loving partners in the interfaith journey that Chatham United Methodist Church has done over the years. They're hurting. They know people who are under the rubble in Turkey. And so I wanted to go and just be in solidarity with them on our behalf to say Chatham United Methodist Church is with you. We are hurting with you. We are praying for you and your country and your people. And those in the leadership of the Peace Islands Institute are grateful. They send their greetings and thanks to you in this congregation. As various clergy were speaking, I was moved to hear a Ukrainian Orthodox priest from Bergen County say with tears rolling down his face, last year when the war started, you came to be with us in solidarity, in care, in compassion for our pain, and now we want to be with you in your hurt, in your time of struggle, in your pain, because through our pain, we have become brothers and sisters. I heard another clergy person say, you know, sometimes insurance companies call earthquakes an act of God. And we stand here today to unequivocally say, this is not an act of God. This is an act of nature. There is a difference. Julie will tell you that last night when we were driving to have dinner with my mom, we were listening to the BBC on the ride to, uh, to my mom's place. And uh, I heard the BBC reporter refer to the earthquake as an act of God, and I almost was apoplectic. <laughs> I started yelling at the radio. I'm going to email that guy on the, on the BBC and say, this is not an act of God. This is an act of nature. There is a difference. Stop slamming the name of God. Another clergy person said, the scriptures say we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. And now we weep with those who weep. A rabbi said, Elijah, when he said Elijah, he started telling Elijah's story, I thought to myself, ooh, I'm thinking a lot about Elijah this week too, because that's, our text involves Elijah, who's in this transfiguration conversation with Jesus and Moses. He said, remember Elijah was fleeing for his life. He had spoken truth to power. The power didn't like it, put a death 
warrant out for him. So he fled into the desert, the desert of Damascus, fleeing for his life. He found himself searching for God, searching for God's guiding hand, searching for a word from God. A wind came so strong that it split rocks. But it says in 1 Kings, in the Hebrew Scriptures, Elijah said, God was not in the wind. A fire came, but God was not in the fire. An earthquake came, but God was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was the sound of sheer silence. Some scriptures call it a still, small voice. And that is where God was for Elijah. Not in the earthquake, but in the stillness that followed. I found myself wondering, did Moses by any chance experience an earthquake too? So I Googled it. Did Moses experience an earthquake? Sure enough, he did. Up on Mount Sinai, right before he received the Ten Commandments, the earth shook, it says in the book of Exodus. And it was after the earthquake that Moses received a word from God. Can you think of some earthquakes that happened in the Jesus narrative? Sure enough, the moment that Jesus dies on the cross, the scriptures say in the Gospel of Matthew, the earth shook and the veil in front of the temple was torn in two and people's eyes were opened to the mystery of God doing something in receiving on the cross the worst that humanity can give to God's greatest gift and God responding with love, with hope, with forgiveness, with resurrection. Three days later, another earthquake. It says on Easter Sunday morning, the earth shook. The tomb was opened as were other tombs. So that after the earthquake, we could see into the emptiness of a tomb. I wonder if the three of them were talking on the Mount of Transfiguration about their earthquake experiences. We don't know what they were talking about, but each three of them experienced an earthquake. And then this morning, Psalm 99 says, let the earth quake. Friends, God does not cause earthquakes. It is part of the mystery of the way this earth continues to create for the last four billion years. But God is with us in the aftermath. God is made known in the emergency responders who are rushing towards tragedies, whether that's in Michigan or in Syria or in Turkey. God is present in the community of care and love that forms in those communities and in a global context. God is present through the generosity of millions who don't know what to do but contribute money to United Methodist Committee on Relief or some other agency that become the hands of compassion to a hurting people. Friends, we always have this passage, this transfiguration passage on the last day of Epiphany before we start the season of Lent with Shrove Tuesday, the final prayers that we pray outside around the fire where we burn the palms from last year's Palm Sunday. We say a prayer that begins technically the 40 days season of Lent. 
We come back on Wednesday for Ash Wednesday when we remember our sinfulness, our mortality, and God's love and forgiveness in the midst of it all. And for 40 days, we are invited as Christians into a, an intentional time in the wilderness, reminding ourselves of Jesus 40 days in the wilderness, Mo Moses 40 years in the wilderness, 40 is biblical code for a long time. And we're invited to spend those 40 days intentionally seeking God. And it might be a wilderness experience. Elijah spent time in the wilderness of Damascus. Moses spent time in the wilderness of the Sinai Desert. Jesus spent time in the desert after his baptism. The disciples spent time in the desert of unknown, not knowing. And we're invited like these three to listen for God in silence. Maybe spend a few moments every day just being silent. It may seem like suffering to us. We're not used to that. But that's where God might be speaking. We're invited to listen and look for God in creation as Moses did speaking from a burning bush or in the creation of rocks becoming a word, a tablet, a guiding hand, or perhaps our 40 days of Lent can be focused on listening for the voice of God that spoke to Jesus at his baptism and spoke to us at our baptism that says, you're my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. You're my beloved child. Friends, however we spend our Lent, I invite us and challenge us to be intentional about setting some time in our day apart to just be present. Present to God. May it be so for you and for me and for all who are searching for God, yearning for hope on the journey to resurrection. Amen. dove on a rooftop and help us to take note. God, we give thanks for your expressions of compassion disguised in humble human beings who rush towards disasters with the hope of caring for someone who is in need. Bless all of those people who are doing this on a regular basis and use each of us as well to pick up on someone's pain and to go with them, to let them talk about it, to walk alongside of people who are hurting. Some of those people, oh God, are mentioned in our prayers. And we lift them up to you and ask that you would bless and heal and comfort even in this very moment of prayer. We pray for Dave's mom, Addie, who is dealing with some health concerns. We pray prayers of gratitude for first responders and all who are doing good in the world. We pray for Allie 
and all students, family, and faculty after the shootings at Michigan State University. We pray for all campuses and all who are connected with them who who see this news and are worried. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for the people of Turkey. We pray for the people of Syria. We ask for your healing and comfort for those who have suffered because of the earthquakes. And we ask your blessing on those who are feeding people in the midst of the earthquakes aftermath and trying to rescue as best they can. We pray for the United Methodist Committee of Re on Relief and for all relief agencies who are providing comfort and aid. We pray for Ava in need of your healing touch and for her friends and family as they are concerned for her. We pray for Carol and Hal who are missing and grieving for Ian, their son. For a friend named Suzanne who is undergoing surgery on the 24th. God, these are just a few. You know each of our prayers. You know each of our worries. You know each of our gratitude. We lift all of it to you. In the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples to be bold and praying together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we can forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for